Today I'll be talking about the applications of linear algebra to differential equations. A differential equation is simply an equation that relates a function with its derivatives. They are quite important to understand and utilize because many of the laws of the natural and physical world are governed by some form of differential equations. They play a significant role in the study of science, applied mathematics, physics, engineering, biology, and even economics. Let's take Newton's second law of motion in its most generic form. Force equals mass times acceleration. By definition, this law states that acceleration is due to force, meaning that the forces that govern our universe are most easily modeled through differential equations. Acceleration is the time derivative of velocity, and velocity is the time derivative of position, which means that acceleration is the second time derivative of position. Hence, Newton's second law is expressed as a second order differential equation that allows us to solve for position. As preliminary applied mathematics classes teach, Newton's law has a multitude of applications. For instance, it can be used to determine the motion of a simple pendulum by deriving a differential equation of the form shown on the right. A crucial feature of systems of differential equations that can be analyzed using linear algebra techniques is that the systems must be linear. This means that the differentiation of the functions must be able to be represented through linear transformations. This fundamental property is demonstrated by writing the system as a matrix differential equation in the, sh in the form shown, where the x functions are all represented by a vector of n length, the x prime functions, which are the derivatives, are all represented by a vector of n length, and the a matrix is as shown. The solution of the matrix differential equation is a vector valued function that satisfies the given relationship for all values of t, real, and greater than or equal to zero. By the way, using the terminology of chapter 4, the set of all solutions is considered a subspace of the set of all continuous functions with values in Rn. Thus, a fundamental set of solutions, which is the basis for the set of all solutions of the aforementioned matrix differential equation, the solution set must also be an n-dimensional vector space of functions. When the A matrix is conveniently diagonal, as shown by the example, the solutions of the matrix differential equation are relatively simple with the use of rudimentary calculus integration topics. Elementary calculus yields the solutions of the position functions with constants C1 and C2. The solution we found can then be written in the form shown. This leads us into possibly the most important notion established in this chapter. The prior example suggests that for the general matrix differential equation, a solution might be a linear combination of functions in the form given for some scalar quantity lambda and some constant non-zero vector v. As shown earlier, these equations are derived primarily from elementary calculus topics, since the quantity e to the power of lambda t times t can never equal zero, as no value of t results in the quantity becoming zero x prime of t will only equal the matrix differential component, aka matrix A times x of t, if and only if lambda times the fixed vector is equal to matrix A times the fixed vector, which thus defines the seemingly arbitrary lambda scalar quantity as an old reliable eigenvalue, which also means that the fixed vector v is the corresponding eigenvector. This whole line of reasoning establishes that each eigenvalue eigenvector pair effectively acts as a solution of the matrix differential equation of x prime equals matrix A times x. Such solutions are called eigenfunctions, which you will see in the coming examples are extremely important to solving systems of differential equations. The circuit system shown on the right is defined by the matrix differential equation shown here x1 of t and x2 of t are the voltages across two capacitors of time t. Given the initial conditions of the system, we are tasked to find formulas for x1 of t and x2 of t that describe how the voltages change over time. The A matrix is given to us, meaning that the matrix differential equation is also given to us. Since we know the initial conditions, we can easily plug them into the A matrix and solve for the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors. Additionally, since we know that v1 and v2 are linearly independent, which means that they span R2, all we have to do to find the remaining constants, named C1 and C2, is to mix x of 0 equal to x0, which is essentially just plugging in our initial conditions and solving. This simple computation leads to C1 equaling 3 and C2 equaling negative 2. Therefore, the solution to the problem, which was to find formulas for the voltages with respect to time, is complete and validated as shown here.
when the base functions are graphed against time, which are the functions being related to their derivative, the position function for example, the general trend of the function's direction and magnitude can be observed. Either the position functions decay to zero as the parameter approaches infinity, or the opposite happens. If all trajectories are drawn towards the origin, then the origin is considered to be an attractor or a sink. However, if the eigenvalues in the previous circuit's example were positive rather than negative, then the corresponding trajectories would be putting away from the origin, meaning that the origin would be considered a repeller or source of the dynamical system. Furthermore, the direction of the greatest repulsion would be the line containing the trajectory of the eigenfunction corresponding to the positive eigenvalue with the largest magnitude.